My hands are calloused and my sight is strained. Technicolor vision in grayscale lenses. Pull back the curtains. Let the light invade. There's a city that's waiting, waiting for your spark to catch the embers. A holy fire that cannot be contained. A city ablaze, burning for your name. Let my life be a catalyst flame. Lift my eyes to see the plans you've made. A city on fire. A monument of holy arts in awesome surrender. I see you moving, God, even in the ash and ember. Fan the flame. Pull back the curtains. Let the light invade. Welcome, Pathway Church, at all of our locations, and those of you who are watching online to this final weekend of our series, Make Your Mark. Now, all throughout this series, uh, we've really been underlining the fact that we have one life to live. We've got one chance to really make a difference. And so, we've been unpacking, really, God's plan to live beyond ourselves, really, so that at this kind of stretch of the race that we can really make an impact for God. We can make our mark. And so the first week, we talked about that we have to push ourselves. We've got to push ourselves outside of our comfort zones. We've got to push ourselves outside of our uh, safety zone so that we can make our mark. And then the, the second week, we talked about if we're going to make our mark uh, with God's love, it calls us to be able to reach out and protect those who can't protect themselves. And then last week we talked about everybody is somebody for whom Christ died for. And so if we're going to make our mark, we've got to do that by reaching out to those who are difficult to love. Now this week we're going to be talking about making our mark through what we speak. And it reminded me of a story of a country church in a small European village where an altar boy... He serves communion to the priest, and he accidentally drops the cruet of wine. The village priest shouts in an angry voice, Leave this altar and never come back. Later, that boy becomes Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia, a communist dictator. In another cathedral, though, another altar boy serving the bishop at Sunday Mass drops the cruet holding the wine. But with a warm smile and a twinkle in his eye, the bishop gently whispers, Someday you'll be a priest. And later, that boy becomes Archbishop Fulton Sheen. What we speak is powerful. Our words have power and has the, have the ability to be able to have life-changing effects on people and life-changing effects really upon this whole world. And as Christ followers, in a positive way, we can use our words to be able to make a mark on people, an incredible mark, an indelible mark that will, that will last forever. Now, the reality is in our culture, things have run amok, I think, in terms of the way that we speak. Specifically, where I see the problem is in the area of rudeness. Everywhere we look, we can see that kind of rudeness, really, in our culture is, is just on a rampage, and, and it hurts people. It's interesting, I read a two-year study uh, this last week on rudeness. It says that six out of ten Americans believe that rudeness is on the rise. It also said 79% of people feel like rudeness is a serious problem, and that 73% of people uh, said that American culture uh, used to be more respectful. In a USA Today article recently, uh, it was entitled, The Decline of Civility, Why People Are Rude and How It Harms Society. And in that article, it stated, rudeness is becoming common occurrence in American life. If you don't like it, lump it. 
mind your own business, or get out of the way. And my point here is that rudeness, in terms of the way we speak and we interact with people, is become mainstream in our culture. It's part of almost the way that our culture operates. And obviously one of the places that we see rudeness profoundly and how we see it accelerated is on social media. Now recently there was a young woman, I don't know if you saw this in the paper, uh, that was killed in a car accident just off the canal route in North Wichita. And it nearly uh, stopped traffic for about three hours while they investigated and they got this wreck cleaned up. And it was interesting, social media lit up in anger for how traffic had slowed down uh, during this accident. And a young lady from our church chimed in on this about how hurtful it was as a victim when people are so insensitive, especially when somebody gets killed. She recalled when her own brother was killed in a car accident and how hurtful it was to her and her family as people just indiscriminately uh, chimed in and made all kinds of crazy comments online. Rudeness is that epidemic proportions in our culture, in our society, it's so commonplace, and at the same time, it's causing all kinds of hurt and pain and emotional scars. Now, there are all kinds of rationalizations I think you and I have uh, for rudeness. So one of the rationalizations I think that we use is that, you know, we're all so busy, the pace of life is busy, and so we don't have time to be polite. Another rationalization we use for rudeness is that it's a parent problem and that parents uh, aren't teaching their kids good manners and so rudeness has just become uh, prevalent in our culture and society. And another rationalization I think we have for rudeness is that it's entertaining, it's funny. And so now we pay people like Howard Stern all kinds of money to be rude for a living. So we've got all kinds of rationalizations. But you still have to ask yourself the question, what's driving people to be so rude. And one of the key reasons I think that people are rude is ignorance. I believe ignorance is a major cause of rudeness. Now, when I say that, I don't mean to be rude when I say that. I'm just trying to, to state a fact. It's just, it's just ignorance. People are ignorant of the fact that they are loved by God. They are the ignorant of the fact that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice not only for our sins, but also for every single person in the whole world. And that when we are rude or we mistreat someone, it's as if we are being rude and we are mistreating the person of Jesus Christ. Remember, we talked a little bit about this uh, last week. So it's ignorance, but I also believe it's arrogance. Most of the time, arrogance comes from being ignorant. So I think we operate by this formula. It is ignorance plus arrogance equals rudeness. Basically, in our ignorance and our arrogance, we shake our fist at God and we say other people don't matter. We can, we can say whatever we want to people because they deserve it. They deserve what we are saying. But if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I think God calls us to a different standard. He calls us to a different formula. I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a Jesus formula today, and that formula is knowledge plus humility equals respect instead of ignorance we need knowledge we need to know that others matter to god because everybody is somebody for whom christ died for and instead of being arrogant or self-centered we humble ourselves before christ and because of that we in turn humble ourselves before others and we treat other people more importantly than ourselves we respect them we show them love and that's why it says in 1 Corinthians 13, love is not rude. Love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now specifically today, as we talk about using our words to make a mark, I want to deal, though, with this problem of rudeness because rudeness, I think, has so infiltrated our culture and become so mainstream, we've really kind of got to get our heads wrapped around it so that we can make our mark in this world. I really believe rudeness totally decaffeinates 
the love of God. It, it takes the power out of love. But on the other hand, on the flip side, if we use our speech in a God-honoring way, I believe there's incredible uh, a power and love that can flow through our lives to be able to make a mark, a real significant, an indelible mark, I believe that will last forever. And think about the way that Jesus uh, made a mark in, in, in humanity in this world. Jesus showed love even when we were rude to him, even when we sinned against him. What did Jesus do when we were rude to him or we sinned against him? Was he rude right back to us because we deserved it? No. Jesus wasn't rude back to us when we were rude to him, when we sinned against him. No, he showed us love. He made his mark in this world by doing a rude reversal. He made his mark in this world by doing a rude reversal. Instead of showing us rudeness right back, he showed us love. That's how he did it. So how do we do that? How do we do that specifically in terms of the way that we speak? Well, in Proverbs chapter 15, it says, what a joy it is to find just the right word for just the right equation. And what the writer here is talking about is talking about tact. Tactfulness is thinking before you speak. So if we want to make our mark in this world, we do that, first of all, by being tactful, not just truthful. All right? The way you say something either enhances or it detracts from your message. You can say something five or six different ways, and it will be received in different ways, even though you might use exactly the same words. I mean, really, tactfulness is relational lubrication. It minimizes friction between people. And if we were to kind of maybe define tactfulness, tactfulness might be, in essence, uh, tact is what you thought but you didn't say. <laughs> tactfulness is the ability to make a point without making an enemy. Or another great scripture to think about tact is in Ephesians chapter 4, where it says, instead, speaking the truth in love. It's not all about truthfulness. It's about how we share that truthfulness. Or Proverbs chapter 15, where it says, kind words bring life, but cruel words crush the spirit. Because you and I, if we break a, a physical bone in our bodies, that bone is going to heal in a matter of weeks. But if we wound somebody emotionally, it could take a long time for them to be able to heal emotionally. It could take years, even a lifetime, to heal emotionally from the words that we say. So the first way we can make a mark with our words is we being tactful in terms of how we say things. Now next, make your mark by being understanding, not demanding. You know, Luke chapter 6, it says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Now that, that's the golden rule. So treat others the way you want to be treated. The reality is we don't want people to be demanding of us. We want them to be understanding of, of whatever is going on in our lives. So, so for example, I want you to think of some, some scenarios in your head. The first one is, how do you treat people who serve you at a restaurant? I mean, to me, one of the great tests of our character and, and, and a great mark that we can make in people's lives, sometimes on a daily basis or, or a weekly basis, is how we treat a waiter or a waitress. You know, it's interesting, as I talk to wait staff, they tell me that some of the rudest people they deal with are people who have Bible studies in restaurants. Isn't that terrible? And you know what they say? They don't tip good and they're rude. The people there, where they got their, all their Bible all open. Those are the people that are the rudest. Or another question you might ask yourself is, how do you treat your secretary, your employees, or that customer service person on the phone who doesn't speak good English? Are you understanding or are you demanding of them? Or another good place you might... Uh, put into practice understanding and not demanding is at home. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes what happens to me is, you know, all day long, it was nice, nice, nice. <laughs> and so when I get home, it's kind of like I'm out of nice. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, you know, my wife or my kids might say something, and all of a sudden, I'm rude. And so for the people that sometimes that I am to love the most, who mean the most to me, those are the people that I can be the quickest and the rudest and the most disrespectful to. 
And, and, it, and it's terrible. And so I want to say to you, especially maybe uh, husbands today, and I'd probably say this out of my own guilty conscience, this man, especially you know, when you've, you've got kids at home and everything else, your, your spouse, your wife, man, she's got herself being pulled in about 10,000 different directions. And so when you come home, even though maybe you've had, you've had a hard day too, to be able to say, I'm going to be understanding. I'm not going to be demanding. And it's an incredible way that you can make a mark, an indelible mark in the life of your family when you do that. Now, another way that we can make a, an indelible mark, a mark that will last forever, is by responding politely. Never respond to rudeness by being rude yourself. It, it only adds uh, fuel to the fire. And, and listen to these words in Romans chapter 12, where it says, Do not repay evil with evil, overcome evil with good. Now, before I tell you how to maybe apply this verse uh, in a positive way, let me share with you a letter uh, written to a rude neighbor about how not to apply this verse, all right? It says, Dear Frank, we've been neighbors for six tumultuous years. When you borrowed my tiller, you returned it in pieces. When I was sick, you blasted rap music. And when your dog went to the bathroom all over my lawn, you laughed it off. But I'm certainly not one to hold grudges. So I'm writing you this letter to tell you that your house is on fire. <laughs> Cordially, Bob. <laughs> so to me, this is a great example of how not <laughs> to be able to apply this scripture. But instead, what Jesus calls us to do is to not to repay evil for evil, but instead overcome evil with good. And one of the places, I think, in our contemporary culture where it's, it's so easy and there's a lot of temptation to be able to repay evil for evil is on social media, in texting, and in emails. I mean, when you see somebody say something on social media or you get a text or you get an email at work, I mean, sometimes there's just this rage that comes in with your soul that, man, you just want to go right back at them. And, man, right away, you're just typing away. <laughs> But I want to give you some guidelines because I, I think this whole area of, of social media and texting and email is such a, this digital way of communicating is such a part of our lives. And how that we use our words, I want to give you some, some, some guidelines, so to speak, to really help us be able to make a more positive mark in this world, uh, particularly as it's around this uh, subject. So first, don't post or send anything that you wouldn't want printed on the front page of a newspaper. Because in today's digital world, things get hugely magnified and amplified in a way that they never have before in, in this digital age. And so what would you, would you write or post or send something uh, that doesn't re represent really the person of Jesus Christ well? Don't do that. Don't send something that doesn't represent Jesus' heart, his value of unity, and the value that he places on relationships. Remember, your words have great potential to be able to do good, to be able to make a positive impression for the person of Jesus Christ, to be able to make a mark in this world, but they also have incredible power to do something horribly negative and horribly destructive. So be very careful before you push that send button what, what you're writing down. Next, the other guideline I want to give you is avoid using electronic communication uh, for controversial or difficult conversations. Remember, in communication theory, only 7% of communication is words. The other 93% is tone, intonation, body language. It's all these other things. And so when you send something in electronic fashion, you're only really taking advantage of 7% of communication. People are missing out on the other 93%. And so I really want to encourage you, and especially in terms of interpersonal issues, uh, issues that can be very cantankerous, do face-to-face -face communication so that you can avoid uh, all these, the, 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 really the downsides of, of digital communication. Only let digital communication be something that's totally supplemental. It really honors that person, values the person uh, when you do face-to-face -face communication. Now to me, as I thought about making your mark with your words. The story that popped into my mind was a story about a guy named John Woolman. 
Now, woman was a 18th century Quaker. Now, if you don't know, Quakers are Christians. Uh, they call themselves the Society of Friends, a la the same group of people that started Friends University. So, a woman, though, back in the 1700s, became very concerned that many Quakers were slave owners. So, as a young man, he was determined to rid the Society of Friends from slave owning. His strategy was simple. He did not hold mass rallies or preach harsh sermons against slavery and against slave owners. He did not chastise or threaten anybody. But instead, for 30 years, he traveled up and down the country visiting with slave owners in the Society of Friends. He would go into their homes. He would accept their gracious hospitality. And then he would gain their respect. And then he would simply and quietly ask, how does it feel to be a child of God and own slaves? There was no condemnation in his approach because he believed that slave owners were people of conscience and they could be helped to make the right decision. He would ask simply bold but disturbing questions that caused people's heart to change. And he was so successful in his dream, so successful in ridding the society of friends of slaves, that 100 years before the Civil War, not one Quaker was a slave owner. Such phenomenal success was the result of one man's passion for justice and for righteousness and his dedication to his task. But perhaps Woolman's greatest strength was how he used his words. He made his mark day in and day out as he traveled up and down the country with the use of his words and his relationships with those people that were slave owners. He was tactfully bold. He was tactful in the sense that he never wanted to devastate anybody emotionally that he was trying to aid. Bold in the sense that he could name an evil and not personally fear the consequences. Tactful in the sense that his approaches were non-condemnatory. But bold in the sense that he risked his reputation and his influence on a sensitive subject matter a century before it became a public cause. And in the end, John Woolman made an indelible mark in this world by the way he used his words. And he wants you and I, God does, to be able to make an indelible mark as well in the day in and day out ways that we speak so that in the end that same kind of be story can be told about our own lives of how that we used our words to be able to make a powerful mark in this world. And what I want to do right now is I want us to pray about that, to pray about how you and I could make an indelible mark in this world day in and day out by the way that we use our words. And so I just want to ask everyone right now, just at all of our campuses, just to bow your head and close your eyes with me. And as we begin to pray today, and you reflect back on this past week or maybe even this past month, I just want you to ask God to maybe bring to someone to mind that you maybe haven't been respectful toward. Or maybe if you're really honest that you've been rude toward. Maybe it was a, somebody that you cut off in traffic. Maybe it was a coworker. Maybe it was a waitress at a restaurant. I know for me in particular, I can think of a specific occasion where I was rude to my wife. That's what it is for me. So as you ask God to bring that to mind, that person to mind, I just want you to raise your hand if you say, I've been rude. I've been disrespectful to someone. If you're like me today and you've done that in the past week or you've the past month, raise your hand. Say that to God. God, that's me today. I want to live differently. I want to live differently. I want to use my words to be able to make an indelible mark in this world. I want to live differently. Praise God. There are hands all over there are hands all over today. Me too. Me too. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we just come before you now, and as we reflect back, God, we know that we've sinned. God, that we've been rude, that we've been disrespectful. We've sneered against people. And God, we just, we just ask your forgiveness. And God, we pray that you just would fill us with your Holy Spirit and your power 
that we would commit ourselves, God, to be able to use our words to be a blessing. God, that we would use our words in a positive way to be able to make an indelible mark in this world for you. God, we know that your word has great power. We know that your Holy Spirit has great power, and you put that inside of us. And God, use our lives to be a vehicle, to be a mouth, to be a tongue, to speak words that honor, that glorify, and draw people closer to you and are a blessing, God, that we'd use our words to make a mark. Now, I know there's others of you here today that you've never taken that first step on the journey of making Jesus Christ the leader and the Savior of your life. And I want to let you know that you'll never be able to overcome evil with good until you have the power of God's love in, his, in your life and in your heart. You'll never have the power to overcome evil with good and in the end to be able to use your words to be able to be a blessing in this world. You won't have sustaining power to be able to do that. And tell that you have the one who did it ultimately in this world who died on the cross for our sins, who overcame evil with good through the giving of his life. And so today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that, to have that love, to have that power in your life. And so I want to encourage you, seize this moment. Make this moment your moment. The moment where you received and you stepped onto the pathway and you made Jesus the leader and the savior of your life. And so today, if you want to make this moment your moment, don't miss it. And I want to invite you right now to be able to pray this prayer with me and receive Jesus as the leader and the Savior of your life. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And forgive me, Jesus, for how I've hurt you and I've hurt others with my words. But today, Jesus, I want to start anew. I want to make you the leader and the Savior of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sin. And now, use me, Jesus. Use my words to be able to make a mark in this world. Now, with everybody's head still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, you made Jesus Christ the leader and the Savior of your life. You stepped on the pathway. Man, I want you to raise your hand real high just as a sign to God that you are all in, that you are all in today. Praise the Lord. I see that hand. Praise God. I see that hand. Raise your hand real high just as a sign to God. Praise the Lord. I see that hand, that you believe in him and so that I can pray for you. Praise God. Praise God. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you so much for my friends, my brothers and sisters here today who received you for the very first time as the leader and the savior of their lives. God, pour down upon them your power, your strength. God, that they would make an indelible mark in this world. God, thank you so much that you have a plan to prosper them, not to harm them, plan to give them a wonderful hope and a future. Lord, we're just so thankful for that, for your promise for them and your promise for every one of us who, who is a follower of you. God, we just love you. We just thank you so much that you've created us for good works. God, we want to make our mark in this world. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.